Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, welcome to our weekly Sunday meeting of the World Council of Muslim for Interfaith Relations. As scheduled today, we have a very important presentation by Dr. Aslam Abdullah on interfaith movements in America. And this is, uh, this is going to be very informative, inshallah. And Dr. Aslam Abdullah has worked in interfaith uh, activities and relations for all his life. Uh, and uh, he is currently the interim president of the uh, World Council of Muslim Youth for Interfaith Relations. And uh, wherever he has been in Chicago, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and other communities, he has been a pioneer of interfaith work. So we welcome Dr. Aslam Abdullah to start. Assalamu alaikum. I was Billahi Mid Shaitan Rajim. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. I would first give an introduction on this terminology of dialogue among different faiths and different traditions. Then I will uh, basically immediately go to the 19th century when these efforts of uh, creating dialogue were concretized and slightly talk about the word parliament of religions because it is that uh, uh, word parliament of religion that led to a number of movements not only in this country but in different parts of the world that what was the background and who were the real people who initiated this movement of world parliament of religion and with what goal because it is important for us to understand the initial uh, 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 understanding of that institution and then finally i would uh, basically give a detailed account of uh, what has been happening since 1893 and for, uh, lastly with i would focus on uh, some of the groups that be, have uh, joined the interfaith group in the last uh, few decades to have an impact from their perspective and their understanding of other religions, not their own religions. So uh, this is what the methodology of the presentation is. Now, this movement of dialogue among you know, people belonging to different traditions and different uh, faiths has at least seven or eight different names. And each has different connotation, and I would uh, go over those as well. Interfaith, we all know, is a dialogue, basically. Then you have interreligious. You have uh, dialogue. You have ecumenical dialogue. Then you have the terminology called interpath dialogue. You have the terminology called interbelief dialogue. You have the terminology which is called the transbelief dialogue. You have the terminology which says that uh, non denominational uh, dialogue. And then you have also the, the terminology which we call the plural, pluralistic uh, rationalist uh, 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 dialogue. Now, some of the groups, specifically the Catholic, uh, uh, you know, ecumenical groups, have tried to define the differences among these various terminologies. Even though we have not made those kind of differences, but uh, we usually accept uh, those things without any critical examination. They say that the ecumenical is a relations and prayer with other Christians. That is what the Archdiocese of Chicago uh, basically came up with that. Interfaith, they say that the dialogue that takes place among the Abrahamic faiths, like Jewish, Muslims, uh, and, 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 and Christians, of course. And then interreligious, they talk about uh, other religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and Sikhism. And then interpath, dialogue or interbelief dialogue you know also includes um, uh, various 
other religious communities and there are approximately 7000 religious traditions in the world and this interbelief dialogue interfaith dialogue uh, or trans belief dialogue includes all these things so in order to for us to be effective in these dialogues we as a group has to think in terms of defining of these various terminologies that are currently in use and our perspective and positions on, on, on that. Certainly one can go over the history, uh, you know, that how various religions in the past who were living in conflicts and who were living in a perpetual hostility towards each other, uh, you know, also uh, followed certain uh, methods to, to have dialogue among themselves. But in 1893, something unusual happened, and that unusual thing was that the, that uh, some individuals in the United States decided to organize a World Columbian Exposition, which was the shortened name for the World's Fair Columbian Exposition. Also, it is also it was also known as the Chicago World Fair. And it was held to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus and his arrival in the uh, in what they call the New World of the United States. And it, it took place in Jackson Park in Chicago. You know, almost. Uh, and uh, dedication ceremonies of that fair were held in a, on October 21st, 1892. And the fairgrounds were opened in May 1893. That was the time when approximately 8,000 people from different parts of the world, as well as from the United States, were present. And at that particular time, two individuals, uh, one was uh, what we call the the the, the individual's name was, uh, I think, uh, uh, Charles Bonney, and the other one was uh, Sudenberg. They belonged to a new religious tradition that they themselves were the pioneers. The Sudenberg uh, believed that Jesus had spoken to him and had convinced him, given him the revelation, that he would accept even the non-Christians as long as they continue to do good things. And uh, Charles Carroll Boney, who was the judge of the Supreme Court of Illinois, uh, he was also a member of uh, this particular church. And he was also uh, the founding member of the New Jerusalem Project which also believed that uh, you know the the acceptance of jesus as god is essential but uh, you don't have to accept uh, uh, christianity as a whole you can follow your own religious traditions uh, as long as you continue to do good and accept jesus as as so these two individuals thought of the idea of organizing the Parliament of World Religions at that particular occasion, taking advantage of the presence of so many thousands of people who had gathered there. Now, very interestingly, the people who picked up the idea and who welcomed the idea were the people who were from the Indian religious communities. Now, Jains, Brahmo Samaj, uh, uh, Hindu, uh, Hindus, uh, Buddhist, they were all part of that. Uh, Sikhs were not. Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints were not. Native Americans religious were not invited. And, 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 uh, you know, and many other religious traditions were not presented at that particular time. 
So the Jain preacher, Veer Chand Gandhi was there. Buddhist preacher, uh, Dharampala was there. Uh, the, uh, from the Zen tradition, Soyan Shaku was also from India was there. Swami Vivek, Vivekananda was there. Then um, there was this Brahma Samaj man, Pratap Chandra Mujamdar was there. And Theus Sophical Society that was also uh, 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 influenced by Hindus, Annie Besant was, was there. Now, what happened in that particular conference that Swami Vivekananda basically uh, stole this whole show. And uh, he was the only one who received uh, two minutes standing ovation in that parliament when we opened his mouth. He, he began the address by saying, sisters and brothers of America. Uh, in a very carefully drafted speech in which he introduced Hinduism and in which he basically developed uh, that, uh, that, that idea that if uh, any religion has shown to the world that uh, pluralism is a reality, it is Hinduism. He didn't talk about casteism. He didn't talk about anything else. You know, uh, the... the, the oh, oh, many other things he basically focused on that message of, of pluralism and uh, certainly it was uh, through his effort that the hinduism became the the known entity in uh, the in the united states and paved the way for a number of uh, ashrams a number of religious uh, hindu uh, religious uh, 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 you know things that 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 that, that took place in the, the country. So that was basically the birth of, of, of uh, the interfaith dialogue in a in, in an organized manner. It, it took place in 1893 and it had been, you know, it has since then had held, I think, nine or ten meetings since then. Now, Inspired by what happened in the in in, in 1893 in 1900, uh, the International Association for Religious Freedom (IARF) was founded, and uh, in 1987 its uh, purpose was uh, revised to to include various other religious traditions that were not uh, initially considered as religion. And uh, in, in 1996, uh, you know, I, uh, ARF uh, also recognized, uh, you know, the Muslim uh, participants for the first time. Now, in the Parliament of World Religion, there was a Muslim who was present there, this was Alexander Russell Webb. There is controversy about him because Ahmadis claim that he was an Ahmadi. And uh, certainly he was uh, a convert. He was uh, the council, US council in the Philippines. And he converted to, Chris, to, to, to Islam. He was also the editor of the Missouri Gazette. In, in, in Missouri, and then he wrote a book, uh, Islam in America. And that is, I think, the first book about Islam that was published uh, around uh, that particular time in which he offers a critique of Christianity and he also talks about Islam, introduces Islam. So that, but, but in general, Muslims uh, in general have not owned him as a genuine Muslim because they consider that he was uh, Ahmadis. Uh, one doesn't really know his uh, true beliefs because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the claim Ahmadis are making about himself. Now, immediately after the 1900, in 1914, after World War I began, I mean, 
the Christians, a group of Christians, um, uh, uh, assembled in Cambridge. And they founded an organization called Fellowship of Reconciliation. And the idea was to bring uh, people of different faiths together to promote peace. And, uh, and it became a leading interfaith voice for nonviolence and non-discrimination. Now, in our world today, it has branches and affiliated groups in nearly 50 countries of every continent. And the membership includes uh, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, Muslims, indigenous groups, you know, Baha'is and other groups also. In 1936, the World Congress of Faith was founded in London. And it is also one of the oldest interfaith bodies in the world. And one of its purposes is to uh, help people of different faiths to enrich their understanding of their own uh, religious and other traditions. It does this by offering opportunities to meet, explore, challenge, and understand different faith traditions through events from small workshops to large conferences uh, and conversations and publications. In 1949, after the World War II, uh, Fellowship in Prayer was founded again, you know, uh, and by Carl Ellison Evans and Catherine Brown. Both of them believed that the unified prayers would bridge theological and structural religious differences. But it was in relation to what uh, the Europe had witnessed in 1949. In 1952, International Humanist and Ethical Union was founded in Amsterdam. And it is uh, uh, the sole word umbrella organized it claims the sole word umbrella organization embracing humanist, atheist, rationalist, secularist, skeptic, ethical, cultural, and free thinkers and similar organization worldwide in addition to religious traditions. So they, they believe in a humanist world, a world in which uh, human rights uh, are protected and respected and everyone is able to live a life of dignity. It implements its vision and uh, you know, to influence international policy through representation and information to build the humanist network and uh, let the world know of, of, of humanism. And certainly in several interfaith councils in the United States, humanist groups or the people who belong to this international humanist and ethical union uh, and who are in the United States are part of that. Then in 1958, the Center for the Study of World Religions was formed at Harvard University. And since then, it has been at the forefront of promoting this, uh, the, the study and understanding of world religions. It has supported academia and international understanding in this field, and we certainly need not to talk about Harvard Divinity School because it believes in the Puritan uh, uh, interpretation of Christianity and, 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 and uh, goes back to the traditions of the 16th century. In 1960, uh, Juliet Hollister established Temple of Understanding to provide interfaith uh, education with the purpose of breaking down prejudicial boundaries. And uh, the, 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 it held several meetings and it paved the way for the North American Interfaith Network, NINE, N-A-I-N. In the late uh, 1960s, interfaith groups such as the clergy and lay concern uh, you know, joined the civil rights movements. Now, until this time, with the exception of what we call this um, Muslim uh, Russell, that we don't find any Muslim in any of these initiatives or in any of these kind of discussions, 
if there were any, certainly their names are not there. Uh, or if there were any, then that it included those who were uh, approved, of course, by the founders of these organizations. Now, in 1965 also, we were not present when more than 100 Protestants and Catholic and Jewish groups formed a clergy concerned about Vietnam. And its purpose was to basically challenge US policy on Vietnam. And uh, it uh, was later on renamed as National Emergency Committee of Clergy and Laymen, concerned about Vietnam. It was in 1967, and Martin Luther uh, King Jr. used this uh, uh, platform uh, for his speech, which talked about beyond Vietnam. And then later on, this organization, which is known as CALCAV, uh, you know, was became clergy and layman concerned CLC, and it started focusing on social justice issues and um, issues pertaining to racism and all those things. Now, around that particular time, uh, Vatican II. In, uh, the Pope Paul VI uh, established a special secretariat, which became a pontifical uh, council for relationship with non-Christians. And in their uh, manifesto, they emphasized the importance of positive encounters between Christians and other and people of other faiths. It is called the Declaration on the relationship of the church to non-Christian religions. Nostra et Tata, it is 1965. Uh, certainly a lot can be written about why in 1965 this came, this came up. And the idea was that that was the time when the church finally realized that the colonialism had been defeated, when the church began to realize that um, no longer the force of the, the, the European powers and American powers would uh, uh, be effective in terms of uh, impacting the local cultures, which were once uh, once uh, uh, colonized. So, so they came up with this uh, this idea of uh, this document that would pave the way for the acceptance of uh, Catholicism in, in 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 the world that was previously colonized and all those things. Because uh, uh, they also began to realize that the Europe was not a fertile ground for them anymore because of the uh, uh, expansion of liberalism, because of the expansion of theistic ideas and be all those kind of things. So they basically focused on that thing that would uh, help them make initiative in, in the grounds there. In 1967, the World Council of Churches Conference took place. And it was a, 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 a within the Christian world a, a landmark because it uh, was also the 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 time when the first involvement of the Christians of different denominations vis-a-vis -vis with non-Christians began. Now, 1970 is uh, the year when a non-Christian uh, uh, character, an actor, uh, entered into this arena of interfaith. It was uh, uh, the first World Conference of Religious Religions for Peace that took place in Kyoto, Japan. And this is... Uh, uh, one of the world's largest and most representative multi-religious coalition, advancing common actions for peace. It focuses on dialogues that bears fruit in common concrete actions. So this is a, 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 an initiative that took place in 1970, 1978, Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington was formed. 
and uh, it brought together uh, historic faith communities to promote dialogue, uh, you know, um, it, by focusing on, on, on issues of justice. Uh, it was uh, primarily limited to the District of Columbia, but it is for the first time that we hear that um, Muslims are officially involved in some discussion, some dialogue. That was in 1978. Baha'is and Buddhists and Hindus and Jains and Jewish and later day Saints, Protestants, Roman Catholics, Sikhs and Zoroastrians were all there. Now, in the Muslim world, the initiative was taken uh, in 1981 by a Pakistani-based international organization, which is called the Minhaj al-Quran. Now, this is uh, the conference that claims that it promotes uh, peace, tolerance, interfaith harmony and education and tackle extremism, engage with young Muslims on those kind of things. Uh, and, and of course, it has published some books also. It has also uh, given certain uh, guidelines and understandings on uh, social welfare and promotion of human rights. Uh, but uh, the human rights uh, uh, certainly are, are interpretation is, is, is an issue of debate among many people. In 1986, uh, Pope John Paul uh, invited about uh, 50 Christians and 50 leaders of other faith. And uh, was uh, the idea was to have interfaith, interreligious relationship uh, for uh, uh, the bringing about peace. Uh, um, you know, one of the books that talks about it is called One Christ, Many Religions. Again, going back to the idea of uh, uh, Swedenborg, uh, that uh, as long as uh, Jesus is accepted as God, People can have their own religious uh, identities. People can follow their own religious precepts and do good things and all those things. And that idea recurs in 1986, uh, Pope John Paul II, where basically the idea was, uh, you know, by these bringing out those 100 people, that, uh, you know, it, it basically, uh, it wanted legitimacy for the Christian initiative in international dialogues. That's one thing. Uh, it was seen, of course, a, a theological uh, important issue, event. And uh, it basically promoted the, the, the dialogue at the highest level. And it also uh, recognized that religion can definitely uh, play a, a, a very important role for peace. Now, you know, the, in, in the meantime, this uh, great leader, Hans, uh, the academician, the Protestant, came up with his, his thesis uh, that uh, without having peace within religions, we cannot have peace in the world also. Now, Now, there were, of course, issues in that particular conference. When, pe when Pope insisted that the Christ is the only source of peace, uh, obviously, there were some, some issues, but those who raised that issue were not Muslims. Even though Muslims were present there. And the other thing is that uh, there was discrimination among people of different faith. When it came to the prayers, the people, the Christians, were given a different uh, space and the people of different other faiths were given a different space. All other religious traditions were put at one place and Christianity was separated. Christians were separated from them by going, doing this one. So that is something very interesting. Uh, uh, but we don't find any official um, complaint or any official 
counter argument by any Muslims who were present in that. I think in that particular conference, Imam of Kaaba was also invited. And then in 1991, uh, the Harvard University, Diana L. Eck and I had uh, long discussions with her in the, in the past and you know she interviewed me and then we, we had a lot of discussions on the, she she launched this pluralism project and she started uh, uh, teaching a course on world religions in new england and uh, uh, you know, so what happened is that uh, she focused on the local Boston area and then she started talking about diverse religious communities in Boston area. And then later on, it was expanded uh, to, you know, to, to, to develop interfaith efforts throughout the United States and then the world. The Pluralism Project posts uh, the information on Pluralism Project website. They have a website also. Here, I would like to add a very interesting fact that the, a discussion that took place between his, Steve Johnson, who was the vice president of the American Islamic College, and Diana Eck. I was with Islamic, American Islamic College at that time, you know, in 1987. Uh, Steve Johnson was the president of academics. So Diana Eck is calling uh, Steve Johnson to find out about what is happening to the American Islamic College. And if Steve Johnson is briefing her about uh, the new recruits, and I was one of those new recruits, so, you know, the person who was coming. So Dan asks uh, Steve, what is his uh, theological or ideological bent in all those things? And then the word that I heard from Steve Johnson telling Diana Eck was that he's one of those. Now, what is the code word for one of those? I couldn't figure, figure that out at that particular time, but this is how it did. Steve Johnson was uh, very much in relations with Diana Eck, and Diana Eck, of course, uh, was part of this evangelical Christianity who, who basically we're trying to explore all those uh, various religious traditions there. Then from 1991, we jumped to 1993, and then the Council of Parliament of the World Religions hosted another conference in Chicago after 100 years. 8,000 participants were there, and the Muslims, uh, you know, with the help of Dr. Abdul Hai and many others, uh, Dr. Abdullah Siddiqui, Dr. Irfan, Took definitely a very important or played a very important role. In 1994, uh, Interfaith Alliance was created. And this Interfaith Alliance is the largest interfaith body in the United States. It has approximately 200,000 members according across the United, uh, the country. And it is uh, made up of 75 faith traditions, as well as no faith tradition. And the Interfaith Alliance uh, works to respect uh, the inherent rights of all individuals, as well as their differences, promote justice, uh, policies that uh, protect uh, boundaries uh, between religion and government, and unite diverse uh, voices to challenge extremism and build common ground. By the way, uh, none of the evangelical groups are part of this particular movement. It is considered to be a liberal um, group that has that kind of understanding. In 1995, uh, in San Francisco Bay Area, Interfaith Center was founded. And the idea was again to bring people of different faiths together. In 1996, the Center for Interfaith Relations in Louisville, Kentucky established. And they, they organized the Festivals of Faith, a multi day event that promoted interfaith understanding. In 1996, uh, Kim Bobo, 
founded the Interfaith Worker Justice. It's an organization. Uh, now, even though all these organizations um, are being formed, yet the Muslims in general are not part of any of these things in the formative stage. <coughs> they usually uh, go there, uh, you know, to, to, to bless the occasions, either to read a prayers or either to basically say concluding uh, benediction and all those things. Uh, 1997, the Interfaith Center of New York was founded. And again, the purpose was to develop that kind of dialogue at the grassroots level within the immigrant religious communities. 1998, uh, now something uh, unusual happens, the, the Muslim Christian dialogue emerges. And the idea was to promote a religious tolerance between Muslims and Christians so that they could work for the promotion of peace and human rights. Uh, they held a conference in 2015 at Foreman Christian College. And, uh, you know, and then in 1998, uh, uh, they also created an organization called Interfaith Power in Light. And uh, it is still there. Now, the first initiative that comes, the, I, not the first, the second, first was in 1981, was in 1999, when the Rumi Foundation was founded by the Turkish organization called Hizmet Movement. And uh, Rumi for Forum's uh, purpose is to basically foster intercultural dialogue. Uh, they took a lot of uh, Protestants and the Catholics to Turkey for a visit to Turkey and all those things. And now I'll go over quickly all these kind of details. In 2000, the United Religious Initiative, URI, was founded. Uh, uh, it has uh, uh, approximately 790 member groups uh, in uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, now, after uh, 2001, especially after 2000, September 11 attacks, interfaith relations proliferated. In 2001, the Children of Abraham Institute, which we can call CHAI, was founded to, to, to basically talk about the hermeneutics of peace. Uh, and that brought together Jewish, Muslims, and Christians. Interfaith Encounter Association was established in 2001 in Israel. And uh, it has its presence in the Middle East as well as in the United States. In 2002, the Messiah Foundation International was founded as interfaith and non-religious spiritual organization. Again, the same year, World Council of Religious Leaders was launched in Bangkok. It is again an independent body and it, uh, it supports the work of the United Nations. 2002, Ibu Patel, a Muslim, you know, interfaith, started this interfaith youth core with a Jewish friend and an evangelical Christian uh, leader. And the idea was to bring the students of different religions together to work and uh, to talk about religious pluralism, pluralism. Then in 2003, the Jordanian Interfaith Coexistent Research Center was formed by Father Nabil Haddad. And it provides uh, advice to government and non-government organizations and individual decisions. 
in 2006, the Coexist Foundation was established. It's in the United States. And it is the idea is to have uh, these kind of substantial. In 2007, the Greater Kansas City of Festival of Faiths had this kind of festival and that festival takes place every year. In 2007, uh, Muslims uh, expanded uh, our message in a common word between us and you, where 138 Muslim scholars, uh, you know, came together and they talked about common ground between Christianity and Islam. In 2007, Insight Film Festival took place and it is taking place since then. Then 2008, uh, Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, CUC was established and later on it expanded. Uh, in 2008, this Masjid Umar bin Khattab Foundation, which is in Los Angeles, the University of uh, Southern California, uh, and the Hebrew Union College established the Center for Muslim Jewish Engagement. 2008, uh, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. Uh, he uh, held a conference on interfaith dialogue in which uh, different faiths such as Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism. Uh, you know, uh, were invited. And the, the meeting took place in Madrid, even though it was organized by. In, Gen in, in 2009, uh, Dalai Lama inaugurated the Interfaith World Religions of Dialogue and Sympathy. In uh, 2009, Vancouver School of Theology opened and the Iona Pacific Interreligious Center on the pattern of pluralistic pluralism project of Harvard. In 2009, uh, you know, led by Karen Armstrong, who is uh, uh, the author of the book of Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, a charter of compassion was uh, unveiled. In 2009, uh, the Council of Interfaith Communities was incorporated in Washington. In 2010, Interfaith Partners of South Carolina came into being. In 2010, again, the Project Interfaith began. In 2010, also the Interfaith Center for Sustainable Development was established. Then in 2011, uh, uh, Obama issued the Interfaith and Community Service Campus Institution. In 2016, International Partnership on Religions and Sustainable Development was launched at the Partners for Change. And then again in 2016, National Catholic Muslim Dialogue was established in the United States. This is a venture between the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Islamic Society of North America, Islamic Circle of North America, Islamic Shura Council of Southern California, and Islamic Educational Center of Orange County. Even though, you know, the people write about the history, but they don't mention the name of Dr. Irfan, who was the motivating force behind this uh, dialogue. Uh, then, um, then uh, in 2017, Interfaith Association for Service to Humanity and Nature was established in Pune. So this is in general a, a brief you know, rundown of, of, of the interfaith kind of thing. Now what happened is that since 2012, some very interesting events took place. That was the time when in India, a group of uh, RSS thinkers and the promoters of Hindutva 
decided to create a presence of the RSS ideology in India through media. That was a time when many television stations were launched and that was the time when many new newspapers and new internet groups were launched. That was also the time when the movies like Ramayana and Mahabharata and many other Hindu epics were being done. That was also the time when their subsidiary groups in the United States and the uh, and England, uh, such as HSS, Hindu Swayam Sevat Sangh, or Hindu Foundation, started taking interest in this interreligious movements. Their aim initially was to observe. So they made uh, sure that they are present in almost every, not only parliament of world religions in, in good numbers, but also in other religious organizations. And slowly and gradually they started financing them, supporting them through finances. From 2017 onward, their strategy took a shift. They started rather than focusing on how to introduce their own religion, they started raising questions about the validity of Islam. What is Islam? What is the relationship of violence in Islam? How come, you know, the prophet married a six-year-old girl? All these things, they started these questions. What is the definition of Kufr? What all those side things, very subtly, uh, looking at na with naivety and all those things. And then in 2000, uh, from 17 onward, uh, what they did is that they partnered with several Muslim groups like Islamic Network Group, like ISNA, to change the curriculum, to have a version of Hinduism that suits the interests of the upper caste Hindus. And this was, of course, done with the, with the, with it. Now the situation is that they are present in almost every interfaith initiative, and in that particular interfaith initiative, they are the ones who are basically trying to set the agenda in, as far as uh, issues about Islam and Muslims are concerned. They are the ones who are the most vocal, or they basically raise. Um, is that kind of issues uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the uh, Jewish presence in, in, in that uh, include two major uh, trends. One is in minority, which basically sincerely believes that yes, dialogue is something uh, it would not hurt and harm the Jewish groups. But the other one is very aggressive, which believes that the the forums uh, should not uh, allow any criticism of uh, Zionism or any criticism of Israel. And the, the latest example was that of uh, uh, Houston, a group of Muslims and, and uh, Imams and, and the Jewish rabbis, and 40 of them came up with a statement uh, absolving uh, Israel from any kind of uh, 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 in a role in the Gaza, uh, equating the aggressor with the aggressed upon and uh, justifying what was happening there. So this is uh, in general what basically is happening. The bottom line is that even though ISNA and ICNA and other uh, uh, religious groups Prop, you know, participate in the, in those things, but their participation is that of a token nature in the sense that I they feel happy if they recite a verse of the Quran, and then they proudly announce to their congregations and their people that you know the Quran was recited, that interfaith uh, dialogue, uh, and they feel good about it. Uh, but as far as setting up the agenda as far as representing Islam, as far as uh, clarifying issues pertaining to Islam, as far as you know, raising questions about the validity of other people's uh, engagement in interfaith dialogue, 
they are totally ineffective totally ineffective yes you know in dinners they are present there yes uh, you know in in various kind of initiative they are uh, they show their faces and they give uh, uh, speeches that how great Islam is in terms of promoting peace and justice and all those kind of things. But they have not talked substance as far as the issues are uh, concerned. Uh, they have not yet come up with a common vocabulary. If you are present in any meeting where ICNA and ISNA and uh, these organizations are present and an issue is being discussed, you will find contradictions among the these different organization in explaining even what Islam is all about. And, and, and certainly, uh, you know, if it, that confusion is part of uh, their own thinking, then uh, you can see the confusion at the other level. And in that respect, even though we are present, but we are non-existent in terms of giving any kind of uh, understanding of our faith, of our uh, things. Yes, we also have uh, an, a group of uh, Muslims who are celebratory Imams who are invited basically when 9-11, you know, national events takes place, when a national prayer breakfast takes place. But what happens in those places is not uh, something that basically offers a, an understanding of Islam. It's something that basically offers a public uh, uh, photo up to these individuals where those who are organizing it uh, can comfortably uh, claim uh, that uh, they are pluralistic because Muslims are also involved and uh, gives uh, impetus to those people who are present there to claim that we are part of that pluralism. But the dangers of uh, coming from the Zionists and the Hinduism uh, have not yet been studied fully have not yet been realized and the, uh, the, 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 the nature of dialogue focuses on, on, on things that certainly does not help us give a proper presentation and proper perspective to others. Uh, there is of course a, a, another aspect of that, that while interfaith has open opportunities for Muslims to go to various churches and give their things. But again, that confusion within their own initial, inner thoughts exist. Uh, uh, the Muslims are not yet open to allow uh, the, 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 the non-Muslims to come to their places of worship and, and talk about it or to, to basically share their perspective on, on those issues. So I'll stop here. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم